Ooh, I love that song. Amen to that. Great to see you guys today. Great to have you online. Uh, what a blessing it is. Church, is it a blessing just to be a child of God? Amen. 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 I'm just feeling it today. We are a blessed, blessed people. As we continue to sow for eternity, today is the big day. Uh, for the past three weeks, we have been studying Jesus' lessons, parables on seeds. And today, we get to be a part of that seed-giving, sowing effort in faith, in hope. And in that, we know that God is going to do something with the gift and the sacrifice that we bring forward. And continuing to bring ourselves face-to-face with our missionaries, we continue. Uh, Miss Sydney May today via video. Zoom is going to be interviewing our missionary, Philip Ganta, and his daughter in India. Outstanding job, Sydney. And so let's watch that video at this time. Hey there, it's me again, Braxton Tempest, coming to you from the Park Church of Christ. I wanted to share how much fun it has been to learn about some of our missionaries. I know that Sewing for Eternity helps many more mission points all over the world, and even here in Tulsa. No matter what my age is or what your age is, we can learn and participate in missions in some way. As we get into this final Sewing for Eternity Zoom, we will watch as Sydney May, one of our members, talks with Philip Ganta and his daughter, Apple. Philip Ganta and his family help run a children's home in India, keeping children off the streets and out of poverty. The children's home can house up to 250 children, along with a school for the kids. They are taught daily about God and the Bible. Watch this final interview now. All right, so hello, nice to meet you. What's the time difference? What time is it where you guys are? Oh, it's 11.37 uh, p.m. Oh, oh wow, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's late for you guys. Well, it's nice to meet you. My name is Sydney. How did you decide to open a children's home? What was kind of the inspiration behind that? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, it was uh, in 2001, me and my wife. Our heart is always uh, with the children. We, we love children, so we love children. So. Uh, me and my wife, uh, while we are traveling uh, uh, some other uh, areas and uh, we saw a lot of children are begging on the streets and uh, we saw a lot of girls uh, in brothel homes and uh, and when we heard and when, when we saw those things, we decided uh, why don't we bring these children uh, into our home? So why don't we help them? Then that time we don't have any homes, nothing. I mean, zero. I mean, mm-hmm. then we brought them into our home and uh, we started uh, uh, a small children's home with uh, three, four kids. It's, 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 it's move on, move on, move on. Now we have uh, almost 100 children uh, wow. uh, in that home almost. And we built children's home and school and everything. So so that, that I, mean, I mean, basically uh, we felt love with the children. So. Uh, so we want to do something for uh, our children in our society, so. Okay, you said this was your daughter with you? Yes. Awesome, nice to meet you. What's your name? Uh, it's Apple. Apple, it's nice to meet you. Um, and I see here, they told me that you were in medical school, is that right? Yes, I am. Awesome, what inspired you to go into medical school? Well, um, since I was a child, I've always loved um, helping uh, people around. And uh, since I've seen my dad do all the work, so I say I can say that he's my biggest uh, inspiration to get into this field most likely. And yeah, so I'm just moving ahead. That's awesome. Do you have any big plans after medical school? Are you gonna, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, after my medical school, like after I complete my studies, mm-hmm. I decide on going back to India. Okay. And then, uh, just start working there, like helping the people in my dad's place. I mean, not just my dad's place, but all around in uh, India. Um, how have you seen God working um, recently, like in the past year or so, since we last kind of did the interview with you? The Lord has been uh, so gracious uh, to us. When we starting to build the uh, school for the, for the children's home, because we have the children's home and the children are going to public schools mm-hmm. where they are being uh, uh, abused and uh, 
making fun of them because they they came from lower caste we have a caste system in india so they're suffering a lot so that's why we are decided to build the school so the good thing is it's almost a half a million dollars so when we want to build that one we don't have single dollar in our hands mm-hmm. but we prayed and we just move on and god provided uh, all the money and uh, we built the school and uh, we have the largest christian school in almost in india this wow. is the largest school and uh, the capacity of the school is uh, almost 1500 kids wow we can, we can able to take it that is the greatest thing that lord has done well it's been really nice to meet you um and you too apple it's been cool kind of seeing someone closer to my age that's really awesome seeing someone passionate too about helping people so Yeah, yeah, maybe she 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 can come one day to United States with me. So absolutely, you should come. We can hang out, get some coffee. It would be awesome. It's wonderful to hear about the work in India, and really cool to hear that Apple will soon graduate from the medical school and help establish a clinic in India for the children. God works in great ways all over the world. Park family, we love how you support missions all over the world through sowing for eternity. I tell you what. You know, when you see a guy talking about children suffering and a caste system and schools being established, homes being established, uh, church, what we're giving towards today, with God's help, uh, you are changing eternity. God is doing that through this church. And I am thankful that these past several weeks we've been able to be reminded as these faces are brought before us. If you've got your Bibles this morning, please be turning to the Gospel of Luke chapter 13. We come to our round out lesson, our last lesson, as Jesus teaches on seeds and sowing for eternity. We come to the parable of the mustard seed, Luke 13 and verse 18. A little short one this morning. Then Jesus asked, what is the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare it to? And you can just imagine his audience getting ahead of him. Oh, it's grand, it's huge, it's just monstrous in scope and size. Then their jaws drop open as he says, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds perched in its branches. Before we make too much of the seed and we make too much of the size of the seed, I want to focus in first on this phrase, His garden. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who took a single specific mustard seed and he didn't just kind of sow it, he planted it with care in his garden. Each of us has a garden. Each of us, according to God's will and provision, have a place where we can plant the kingdom of heaven in this world where it brings about eternal change. The book of Acts, chapter 17 and verse 26. From one man God made all the nations, and He marked out their appointed times in history and where, and where men and women should live. It's not by happenstance. From the very beginning, God planted a garden, and He put man in the garden to be about a job of sowing, change, of taking care of the garden, and being about the work of God. Our first point this morning, we understand this. I am in a position to influence others. Each of us has a garden where God has placed us to sow for eternity, to make a difference. You know, today on social media, we have people who are known as influencers. Walmart or some shoe company or some other this or that company pays them or gifts them with their products to try them out and keep them by all means. Because we want to sway you as an influencer with your hundreds of thousands and even millions and tens of millions of social media followers to influence them to like our products. That's your job. Today, if you Googled up the definition of a social media influencer, it reads... An influencer is someone who has, number one, the power to affect the decisions of others because of his or her authority, knowledge, position, or relationships. And then number two, an influencer is someone who has 
a following in a distinct niche with whom he or she actively engages. Now, I'm, I'm no social media influencer. My dreams of influencing people with hair care products, that was gone a long time ago. That's not working out too well for me. But nevertheless, in this real life, you and I can be and are called to be influencers. Over and over again, Jesus would tell almost the same parable. He'd say, well, there was a master of a field. There was a master of a vineyard. There was a master of some agricultural endeavor going on. And he would leave stewards behind. And they had to do something. They had to influence that vineyard or that field. And he would let them know, I'm going to be back. And then they did or didn't influence. And then the master would return and there was a judgment process. How did things go? He told the same parable in other ways. There was a a bridegroom and he was going away. and there were Or he was coming and there were attendants that had a job to do. There was a master of a banquet, and he provided clothes for people attending, and those attending had a job to do. There was something that was expected. They had to influence themselves and others by the clothes that they donned or choose not to put on. Over and over again, Jesus is trying to tell us, we have been put in a position of influence. Today, I want you to ask the question of yourself, What is my place? What is my unique place where God has put me to influence this world for the kingdom of heaven? Is it that job that I've been complaining about a whole lot lately? It's been tough this past year working from home. It's been tough in this situation. And I'm griping more than I'm thanking the Lord for it. But, you know, as I hear the word of God today, I might be someone who walks into the office different tomorrow because I'm not just grabbing a paycheck. I'm not just serving out my time until the next day and the next day. I now am reminded or understand for the first time that I'm there to be an influencer for God, that God has given me that job. Maybe it's your retirement. Maybe it's where you've signed on to be a volunteer. Maybe it's your child's athletic field when someone's losing their mind on the umpire. I mean, everybody knows their kid is the next Mickey Mantle. Doesn't the umpire know that? And you begin to chime in. Maybe it's on social media where you tone down the rhetoric and you bring up the Lord and how He would speak through you. What's your unique place of influence? Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's your neighbors. Maybe it's your other relationships. I pray to God this morning that you are not hearing this challenge, this question as a rhetorical question from someone speaking behind a pulpit, but that you hear nothing less than the Spirit of God this morning asking you, what is your position today where God has placed you to sow eternal change for the kingdom of heaven? What are the tools that He's given you to sow this change in your life? Maybe it's your home. Maybe for the first time in a long time, you begin to invite people into your backyard, your front yard, your living room. Maybe you've been one lately. I had somebody the other day say, oh, it's been a long time and it's beginning to bother me uh, that someone at our church has invited me to be in their home. To which I guess I'm getting to be a little bit of an old preacher where I don't just hear that anymore, but with a loving challenge I say, when was the last time you invited anybody into your home? And they went, hmm, it's been a while. What are those tools God has given you to plant that kingdom in the position He's given you? Maybe it's your hobbies. Maybe it's your gifts. Maybe it's the things you enjoy doing. I I remember, I guess it was almost a year ago, where I see Suzanne Ward out. She's, She's baked cookies, and she's taking them, and she's blessing her neighbors. What's the gift you have? We have men who like to work on cars, and so in our cars ministry, they get together in the shop out back, and they use that tool to bless others and establish the kingdom of heaven. Maybe you're a lawn mowing fiend. That's what you enjoy doing. You're like, no, that would not be me. But there are a few of us that enjoy that. And so you mow your yard and you just keep right on going and you mow your neighbor's yard. And you let them know exactly why you're doing it. 
Because God has given you the opportunity and the tools and the position to be a blessing in their lives. Maybe it's your attitude. You know, there are some folks that show up at church on Sunday morning, and and it's been a year since they've been here, but it's funny, they know where their seat is. And, And boy, nobody had better taken that seat. And so you find that seat. You know, back in the days when I was in youth ministry, I would watch kids come in the youth room, and, and they're just like us, they're younger versions, and a lot of them had their seat, and they, they make their way for that seat, and they sit down, and they wait for their friends to come to them and sit down, and that's okay, but there's a better way, and it's that kid that shows up, and their attitude is their mustard seed. And they show up early, and they don't look for their seat. They look for that doorway. They look for that guest. They look for that member, and they're looking to bless somebody. We, we had a girl one time back in youth group days. She brought a guy who was a sophomore quarterback at Jinx. He ended up being the starting quarterback at Jinx, Jeff Hirschberg. Jeff's parents never came. This was his church home, and he never missed. And Jeff, what he would do... Uh, He never really went on mission trips with us. He never went on summer camps. But when Sunday morning or Wednesday night was here, Jeff would show up and he would look around that youth room and he would look for 6th and 7th graders. And he would sit next to them, he'd put his arm around them, and he would tell them that he was glad they were there. You know what would happen with those 6th and 7th graders that were guests? They would come back the next week. And I was going, boy, my lesson must have really been great. And after a while, I figured it out. It's because the Jinx starting quarterback was not in it for himself, but he was in it for sixth graders from Union and Bixby and Owasso and homeschools and making them feel like a million bucks. Some of us need to reexamine our attitudes of being selfless and instead being servant-hearted. And that's the mustard seed that we have been positioned to plant today in our hearts that has ramifications through our life. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. So we notice this man sows a seed. In the garden he's been given, he brings about change. He brings about something that makes a difference. This small seed grows up into a large tree. Number two this morning, we understand, I am a person of influence. It's what God's called me to be. He's called me to be light. He's called me to be salt. He's called me to be a city on a hill. He's called me to be the leaven that interacts with blobless, you know, dough that all of a sudden begins to do something. Well, we're feeling pretty good about ourselves. We remember the words of Paul to the Corinthian church. Not that we're competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves. But you better understand, our competence comes from God. So we understand in one hand that it's not of us. And so we're nothing. No, 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 no. Because in the other other hand, we understand and we take grasp of, it's everything. Because it is God that is the light and the salt and the thing that makes us shine on top of that hill. In our attitudes, in our actions, and also in our words. We need to understand that faith comes by hearing. And I can live out Christ all day long. But eventually, I need to speak up for Christ. I love that story from John chapter 9, the blind man that Jesus heals. He doesn't know much. Jesus heals him, doesn't even leave his name. Jesus makes his way off. Hey, where is that guy that healed you? I don't know where he is. Well, they healed you on the Sabbath, the Pharisee said. So we know he's a sinner. To which the blind man who can now see says, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know that either. I don't know his name. I don't know where he is. I don't know if he's a sinner. But this I do know. I was blind, but now I see. This is someone who is a person of influence. He does not let what he does not know keep him from sharing what he does know. A lot of us, in our desires to be influential... Let deep theology and all those things we don't understand keep our mouth shut. And this guy doesn't know much at all, but the one thing he does know is about his personal life and the difference that Jesus has brought about. We can all talk about that. I don't know this and I don't know that, but I do know this. I was this way, and because of Jesus, I'm not that way any longer. My marriage would have been this. 
My health could have been that. My relationships were headed this way. But because of Jesus, they're this way. And He's made all the difference for me. This is what a person of influence does. You notice the one thing in Luke's telling of this parable that's pretty unique. He makes it specific that there's one guy planting and there's one garden that's getting it. But a lot of times we get ahead of ourselves in the story and we think, oh, he's just sowing mustard seeds everywhere. Not in this parable. He's got one mustard seed. And with one seed, he bends down and he plants it. This morning, let's remember one thing about this parable and being a difference maker. You're called to be strategic. You can leave here today and you can bless everybody. And sometimes in blessing everybody, we don't get real specific on really blessing anybody down deep. This week, bless everybody. Use that place, your position to bless everybody. But who is that one person right now? Let's get a little bit spiritual here. That the Holy Spirit is speaking into your mind that you're called to bless this week. That one note you're going to write. And you're not going to get out the usual 3 by 5 card. This one's going to be 8 and a half by 11. And you might need a second piece of paper. You could send the text. But sometimes text can't contain what you need to say. And being strategic... Who are you going to bless this week? What lunch are you going to have? What note are you going to send? What dinner party, what Bible study are you going to initiate? Where with the Holy Spirit calling you and now positioning you and now empowering you. I don't know if he's empowering me. Our competence is not from us. It is from none other than the Lord thy God. And He, operating in your life, wants to make a difference through you and in you that you can't begin to imagine. This is gospel. This is good news. This is being a co-worker with the King of Kings. Here's another thing. This planter of one single mustard seed is not just strategic. He sows it. Love is not an intention. That's almost a sick thing after a while. I really intend to love people one day. I really intend to let my children know or attempt to let them know the depth of which I love them. I intend to do that. In fact, I've been intending to do that for over a decade now. Milk is a great thing in my house in the fridge. That same gallon of milk after a year ain't so great anymore. It gets rotten. It gets stale. Love's the same way. This man is not only strategic, he sows it. What's that mean? He does it. What the Spirit is speaking into you now, don't just intend to do it. Do it. Be someone who sows in faith, in hope, that mustard seed. What's that going to look like? Well, It's going to be a great, big, massive thing. Not always off the bat. You know, there was another guy who claimed to be king of the Jews when Jesus was actually the rightful king of the Jews. This other guy named Herod felt a little bit threatened and tried to do Jesus in. Herod did a lot of big things. Here's one. I'll show you a couple pictures. You go over to Israel today. That's Herodium. Those are the ruins of a massive palace on top of Herodium. The interesting thing about Herodium is you go, man, he he picked a mountain to build it on top of. No, he didn't pick a mountain. He built the mountain first. Herod was an unbelievable, on the scale of the Romans and the Egyptians who built the pyramids, builder. Next picture. He builds a temple. Not only does he build the temple, he goes to that original Mount Moriah where Abraham offers Isaac... And he shears off the top 
part of the hill, puts it on the bottom part of the hill, creates a massive plateau, and then builds the temple. The western wall that you see people worshiping at and praying at today is the retaining wall holding new uh, Mount Moriah rebuilt, reconfigured in place. Herod did big things. Israel always struggled because they didn't have a deep water port on the Mediterranean. What do you do if you're Herod? Next picture. You build a port. You build Caesarea Maritima. You get in, you know, so to speak, in the heads of the Romans and you understand aquatic concrete and you do things that man never thought that could be done. You reconfigure the earth. You rebuild mountains. Next picture, Masada. You build a palace where today... We wouldn't even begin to comprehend how you could build a palace on top of an unapproachable, unattainable mountaintop. Now, Herod, the king of the Jews, does all these things. And we wait for our Lord to show up and crack his knuckles and go, just hold your horses. (laughs) Just wait a minute. And all the disciples are going, oh man, show them what big is. You spoke the universe into existence. The one who could take Jupiter and flick it to the far ends of the universe. Oh, this Herod who thinks he can reconfigure land, bring the Himalayas, the Andes, the Alps, the Rockies to this one location. And instead, Jesus says, my kingdom, in light and context of these massive things, is the smallest thing you can imagine. It's a mustard seed. It appears to be almost nothing, but we can understand that from small things come great things. When nature and science combine, you know, you split the smallest of objects, this next picture, an atom, and man, what can come from it? Massive things. You put a few guys in a room together with paper and ink, and in this next picture, things that will change the earth, change our lives 200 years later. You take a senior graduating from high school. This guy graduated in 1947. He had a few ideas that maybe people should be treated differently than they were being treated. And Martin Luther King changes everything. Maybe it's this next picture. About eight pounds. Being born to two poverty-stricken teenage parents. And all of eternity is changed when small things come because grand things come from those things when God is involved. Number three, we have, I have God's perspective on influencing others. From small beginnings come grand endings. Yeah, that note you encouraged me to write, that you said the Holy Spirit was on my heart to write, that's a small thing. And you don't know about the relationship I have with my child or my employer or my neighbor or my spouse. And that that small thing won't bring about anything. And faith and hope says, don't you believe it. Don't you believe it. Well, I know I owe an apology to somebody. I need to say I'm sorry, but our relationship's gone so south that nothing could come of it. Don't you believe it. And if you go under, under your own power and your own accord with no faith and no hope, then you can believe it. But with faith and with hope and with God with you, from small beginnings come grand endings. Well, I just don't know if I've been positioned to really be empowered in that way where small things under His perspective bring about grand endings. Remember Nehemiah? built a wall that saved the kingdom. Nehemiah never builds that wall if he doesn't do one heck of a job being a cupbearer. Remember the story? It was being a waiter and doing that well in faith that then led to him, led him to have a conversation with the king that then led him to build the wall. Remember David? David never kills Goliath unless he does a great job being the driver for Uber Eats. What are you talking about? Jesse to little boy David. Take this cheese and bread to your brothers at the battle. That's beneath me. I'm not positioned for that. Didn't you hear Samuel? I'm going to do great things one day. That's not what David said. 
not what Nehemiah said. How dare you, God, position me as a cupbearer, a waiter? Jesse to David, the equivalent back then of Uber Eats. You take this food to your brothers. You got it, Dad. I'm on the way. Which led to another opportunity of, who's this guy cursing our God? And when is somebody going to do something about it? And David steps forward. Right where you are, I've been passed by. I wasn't seen. I'm retired. The world calls me old. The world calls me sick. They call me beat down. I'm done. And God says, don't you believe it one moment. Your best days are ahead of you. Because you have my perspective. God's perspective of influencing others. These men were positioned to be people of influence. And David and Nehemiah saved a kingdom. Are you ready for not good things in your life, but for great things starting from small beginnings to take hold in your life? Right about now. But Mitch, this last year has been tough. And I just need a break for a while and whoo, it's been tough and I'm really not myself. Let me tell you about a guy who had a tough year. His name was Job. In Job, the book can be preached in multiple ways and address multiple needs and concerns. But one thing that hit me this past week. Job, it says in the early verses, was a good man and careful not to do evil. Chapter 1, verse 5. Job was such a good man that when his kids had a party, he would offer a sacrifice the next morning and pray to God in case his kids had messed up. Job 3 and 25. What I have feared all along has finally happened to me. Job's a good man, but you know what he's in? He's in Dallas cowboy mode. You know what Dallas Cowboy mode is? You get a lead and you proceed to lose the lead because you go into some wacky thing called a prevent defense. <laughs> We're ahead! Woohoo! Let's just stop them, kind of from, let's slow them down. We've been sacking them all day long. Let's stop that. <laughs> let's just kind of slow them down and we lose every time. You're like, Mitch, you're bitter. You're right, I'm bitter. Sorry, that came out. <laughs> Job is a good man. What I feared all along has happened to me. I pray for my kids in case they've sinned. I'm good and I don't ever want to do evil. And then a pandemic hits his life. And it's a pandemic like none of us have gone through. It rocks him at every level to the core. And God doesn't cause it like ours. But he also doesn't stop it. And at the end of Job, Job has gone from good to great. Whatever you've been through this past year, however you've been rocked, and however you want to believe that God's best days are behind you, you are in unique position like Job right now to stop playing a prevent defense and actually let God get in you and go after it and be an eternity-changing disciple of Christ. Amen, church? Amen. So today I ask again, in faith and in hope, how is God going to change your relationships? How is He going to change your attitude? How is He going to call you to ask for forgiveness, to say that you're sorry? How will He start the Bible study through you? When was the last time you invited your neighbor to church? Mitch, that isn't fair. This last year has been rough. I'm going to ask that same question again next week. And sometimes it's not the acceptance that matters. It's the invitation that begins to stir thoughts in their head. When is the next time you're going to decide to show up at work with a new attitude? When is the next time your neighbor going to think you're about random acts of kindness, but they've missed the boat because they were completely strategic? You cleared your schedule to mow the yard, to bless them, to do something God has called you to do. Maybe today 
before you ever plant a mustard seed of faith. Today, through baptism, you allow God to plant faith in you. Baptism is when you say, I can't do it, but God can. And today, I want Him to start in me by planting in me none other than the kingdom of heaven itself, the Spirit of Christ through the Holy Spirit of the living God. Today, if we can pray for you in any way, today, if you would come and put Him on in baptism, would you come now as we stand and as we sing?